what this gets around to is the topic of the moment, which is improving the economics of fuel cells. And I think that we ought to go through them temperature-wise as, as different categories for the topics that will come up. If you want to improve the, the economics of any fuel cell that we have mentioned, is a general statement, put it into mass manufacturing. And that hasn't been done. Two companies are trying to put PEMs into mass manufacturing. One is Ergenix in Florida. The other is Ballard in Canada. Both of these companies are technology development companies instead of manufacturing companies. So they're trying to complete the link of transferring their technology to manufacturing companies. They're trying to license their know-how and designs for mass manufacturing to producers of appliances and other things that go on mass manufacturing scale. They're making the right step at a time that it looks like the market may be ready for them to greatly reduce the cost of the fuel cell. It looks like it could drop from uh, $10 a watt to a dollar a watt through that step, which is a, a appropriate type of change in the um, order of magnitude of what has to happen for fuel cells to enter the appliance market or for the transportation market. The however is that when you look at the automobile, they're used to paying much less for their power plant. Take a 100 horsepower engine that costs a thousand dollars. Say round numbers a thousand dollars for a um, 100 kilowatt engine. That's what we can get it for in the retail market, which means that they can make it for a lot less they're used to a lower cost power plant as a, as a comparison. The other point to be made in that regard is that if you, if you start up in temperature and go to the phosphoric acid fuel cell, it's the same story. You need mass manufacturing that hasn't become available to that industry. The people that are, that are producing the PAFCs, the, the phosphoric acid fuel cells, are not in high production. That industry would produce a much more cost-effective apparatus at higher production. And that industry could be taking the same role of catalyst placement in cost reduction efforts as have the low temperature PEM cost reduction studies. In other words, if you could just get the platinum catalyst where you need it, exactly where you need it, you'd be much better off than they are today where they err on the surplus side. Phosphoric acid fuel cells today have more platinum loading than do lower temperature PEMs. You know, so on the list of things that we want to bring to the marketplace for cost reduction, that's an important one. When you go up in temperature, you start shifting the need to a developmental stage that's behind both the phosphoric acid and the PEMs. The carbonate systems are behind the phosphoric acid and PEMs in development stage. So they're still trying to find the right materials that will be stable so that they can then make a design for mass manufacturing. And that's even more so when you get it in higher temperature systems and go to 1,000 degrees with the oxide uh, transport electrolytes. They're, they're really working hard to find stable materials that they can afford so they can fix the design for mass manufacturing. I think those are important observations with respect to why there's so much emphasis today in terms of investment dollars pouring into the arena in the low temperature cells. The investor can see a, a shorter path to return on investment. And I think that there are two main schools of thought in that regard, and that is towards the stationary power with the phosphoric acid technology and the mobile power with the PEM technology. Two schools of thought. The phosphoric acid people are saying, well, don't worry about the uh, catalyst loading. We're going to amortize over a long period of time, and it doesn't make much difference, and we'd rather err or we'd rather have the catalyst in place. And that's probably pretty good reasoning. If they get some impurities and get some poisoning, it doesn't change much. But if you're just on the ragged edge, 
with the uh, platinum loading in a PEM and you get some poisoning, it's bad news. So for those reasons, I think that you'll see much more emphasis in the, in the PEM and transportation and in the phosphoric acid in stationary power. There's a, and, and accordingly, there's this, the right storage that goes with those two different technologies. The right storage for the um, PEM, if you're going to use gasoline, illustratively, means that you have to add something else. You have to add fuel conditioning to a greater extent than you would have had you wanted to use gasoline in a, uh, a phosphoric acid cell or a higher temperature than phosphoric acid cell. But it goes through that whole litany again of considering the right storage for the right application or for the gap to, to meet the needs of the application. I think that there's a, a really important point to be made regarding economics about the longevity of the fuel cell. It's already been illustrated in the phosphoric acid cell that you could build cells that would outlast most appliances and, and many of the cars we build. They, they could be expected to last longer. So then if you want to get the best life cycle out of them, you have to decide to make a quick transfer, how to make an easy and uh, inexpensive transfer of the remaining life in your phosphoric acid system over to another vehicle. If you, know, if you were in buses, you'd want to um, think of how to transfer it and get some more life out of it. And I think that that's why you see that industry uh, volunteering to say, well, we're going to build them so that there is a seven-year recycling where we're going to rebuild part of it in seven years because they want to make the adjustment as the market adjusts to be the most cost-effective fuel cell in the market. They do that rather than build a better bus last longer? Well, hard to know. Uh, it, it's really... <laughs> It's really an interesting thing. You know, the obvious things looks, would look like building a better bus, but when you really get around to bus engineering, you, you come to the fatigue life of these heavy buses. They finally fatigue. They, they get cracks in them. Even... Yeah, right. <laughs> it's true. But... It, and it's a serious note. electric trolley deals out in San Francisco, though, have lasted... Long time. A long time, and I'm thinking, you know, if we put electric power plant in that type of vehicle, I couldn't last just as long. The way you make... It's moving at, you know, eight miles an hour. It's true. Your stresses are a lot lower. Some of these buses don't do much better. <laughs> some of them do, though. Some of them not <laughs> yeah. But some of them do. They take a lot of uh, road abuse through their duty cycle. And they show it. They You figure out what they're doing in a um, city street condition where they're trying to keep up with traffic and potholes. They take a real pounding. Yeah, well, see, you see the trailer's running on, on, on tracks and the bus is running on the road. So you run into torsionals like this yeah. on the bus, and, and then you got torsionals like this, and that continuous stressing. It's a long wheelbase device, and that really fatigues, really fatigues the vehicle. I can take you out there as on proving grounds and rip stuff up. Vehicles come back to durability. You can see the stress cracks and, and durability of vehicles and everything. I think there's another point to be made in that regard is that, is that if you paid the fuel to carry the extra section thickness to avoid that type of fatigue, you'd lose. You'd pay for a lot more fuel. So you finally get around to the analysis that it's better to put that steel back in the pot, remelt it, and roll it, and make it into another bus. Start it over. And, and uh, as Dale Gates said, you can amortize it over uh, several million miles and it makes good economics to, to stop there and remelt it. Besides, you might want to put another fashion wrinkle in it somewhere. Give us an update on the uh, cell experiment that you're running. Charles, give us a current, current and voltage. Well, it's uh, 0.434 and climbing. That's because it took load off the of when, when it was uh, loaded, did you think that it was getting all the hydrogen that it was making in the electrolysis? Uh, you know, my, my system runs about twice as fast as that. The answer is it couldn't have been getting all of it. Yeah, I think it's leaking out or we're losing it somewhere. This one, this one has, obviously has to have leak because it didn't balance. You know, you couldn't see a balance on the bubbles. 
balance is better now than it is it? But uh, still, it's not perfectly level. Like it okay. Roy, the, the fuel cell, aside from being the most practical way to power an automobile or something for mass application, in my mind, has always been a more practical way just to arrive at the ability to store sunshine. And I, I would think that it had its most practical short-term development potential if that could be done. Well, I think that it also depends on what happens in the near future with respect to regenerative braking. If the re braking. braking. If the uh, regenerative braking proves to be cost effective in the, in, the, in the transportation sector, it'll greatly bolster that electric system. Uh, more energy in a sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> 10 mils at 0.2 volts underload. That means you're not delivering much hydrogen. So let's take a our, our air aluminum battery was <laughs> damn, showing off today. Yeah. <laughs> let's take a let's take a break and we'll hook that up to a hydrogen supply, a tank supply. Hook this little fuel cell. Yeah. Blow it up. Okay, let's take a break. Yeah.